All right, I made a video about this before, I believe. I don't know or don't remember what all I went over in that video, but I'm gonna try to touch base on everything that I learned in a quick summary form when reading up on the sniper, pre-install, trying to research as much as I can to limit the problems I would run into. I'll also include some things that I've seen along the way that I've encountered that have been minor issues that I've overcome and how to deal with them. So, obviously, mine's boosted. So, in case anyone's wondering that doesn't watch the channel, I have a 68 Mustang Coupe. This is an old Ford 302, like 70s model, flat tap it, and it's bored to the max, 60 over. So, I can't put a whole lot of this baby to use without risking splitting this bad boy in half. It is girdled, but, uh, well, new motors and definitely in my near future because I want, obviously, more boost, more power. So, on to the goodies. So, you're looking to get a sniper, but you don't know what to get. You don't know what you need. You hear about problems, etc. So, Holly makes several of them now. In fact, they're now making those uh, Terminator X stealths, which is another option. Now, I haven't researched the stealths a whole lot, or the Terminator X's, to be able to tell you what all they come with, and etc. But, I can tell you the snipers come with a built-in regulator. I don't think the X-Flow has this, because if you get an X-Flow, let's be honest, you're probably not gonna wanna use this internal regulator anyways. So, on to the other goodies. Um, if you're boosted, you won't use this, obviously, since I'm not using it, you see. Holly tells you to run off of the fronts. They tell you to cap this back reg, then run off the two fronts, a feed and a return. Now your fuel line is up to your horsepower ratio and they have charts online. Holly even has a chart of what they recommend for fuel pump wise, for line size, etc. I ran half inch lines, that is a dash eight AN. The Holly bottlenecks that to a six AN on the back side. This front is a six AN ORB to eight AN, if you know what that is. But my feet is here. I wrapped it just to keep the fuel a little bit cooler. I am intercooled, although from my experience and everything I've read and researched, it's not necessary. I'll probably be doing away with it later just so I can have my normal hood latch on it and be able to get my front grill and rock guard and all that good stuff put back on because I won't need the intercooler until I'm pushing a lot of boost. And maybe not even then because it is throttle body injection, which is more or less a carburetor and the fuel cools the air charge. So on to the non-boosted stuff. You're gonna need a return line. Normally you would run it off the regular internal regulator if you're not boosted. If you are boosted, you'll need a boost referenced, that's what this vacuum line is, boost referenced regulator. Even if you're not running an external regulator, I would highly suggest getting a fuel gauge installed. You can do the easy method that I just did, which mine wasn't for a gauge because I have a gauge on my rig. I went to low dollar motorsports and got this transducer. But if you're wanting a gauge, I would say just buy this same little adapter. This is a 6AN ORB to 8th NPT fitting. You can get them on eBay and several other places. And if you're using the rears for your feed and return, you can put the gauge up front where it's easy to see, as long as it won't interfere with your air cleaner. Obviously, I don't have an air cleaner, so it's not a problem. This I put in so I can data log my fuel pressure, and I can also use the Holly's built-in safeties. Holly, one of the huge pluses of EFI is that you can use the software to save your motor. It's not so critical on NA, but on boosted applications, if you starve your motor of fuel while you're putting a whole lot of that spoolie boy into your engine, you're gonna make it go poof. So, this will data log and will also allow me to set safeties. So if my fuel pressure drops below a certain point, it'll cut which I'll get to that in a second, my boost controller and revert back to the wastegate spring, which is the lowest spring size, which is four PSI. I can also set it to cut spark, which will also in turn save my motor a little bit more drastically. So, on to the pre before any of that installation, I should have started here. One thing I read was, excuse the dogs, my neighbors got a big great Dane. One of the things I read was 
obviously your ECU is up front here. Several people have RFI problems coming from the distributor on Fords because, well, this is your Dizzy, that's your ECU. Really freaking close. You see how close my spark plug wire is to it? I have zero issues. Now, I'm running the Edelbrock air gap. These are all your ECU wires right here. I'm passing them down and underneath my intake and feeding them out the back right there. That was the most tucked away, out of sight I could do with them. Now, another thing that I read online to do was get a phenolic spacer. I think that's how you pronounce that. It is a non-metal like cardboard type material or woodish type material. That's what that spacer is down there, a little quarter inch spacer. That will help buffer the heat between the unit and your intake. It'll just keep the heat down on the ECU to make it live a little bit longer. Now, so that thing's cheap. That's, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks for that spacer. Another thing that I read was a bunch of people have issues with these things whistling. And that has to do with uh, the plenum in the middle that separates it. Airgaff has like a little bitty bridge cut. And with that spacer, I don't have the whistle. So I didn't have to do anything else. You can play with spacers to get rid of that whistle if necessary. That's one thing. If you encounter, it's a quick, easy fix. Two. These snipers come with a linkage bar right here. Just like carburetor for your secondaries, except it's one to one ratio. That means if you have a peppy little motor and you go to crack your throttle, you'll get what I like to call bucking. Just like a Bronco. Well, in my case, a Mustang. Where you go to tap throttle and it cracks you know, the primary and the secondary, so then you lurch forward. So it slings you forward. You let off the gas and it continues that path until you just like let off the gas completely. So things you can do to fix that, buy a progressive linkage, easy peasy. You can buy the little cheap one uh, solid piece. It's not adjustable for like, again, 10, 15, 20 bucks, I think. I bought this, uh, get the damn light, whatever I did with it. Mm, here we go. Sorry for not being ready. All right, I bought this bad boy. That little stainless steel hickey there. All right, I'll stick that. So I got this thing. That allows me to thread it and adjust when my secondaries kick in. I have it adjusted out to where it's right about maybe maybe over fifty percent. I don't even remember. I need to actually check that so I can tune it because there is an adjustment in the EFI to tune for progressive throttle linkage. So I believe that will help deal with your injectors per bore when they're injecting. Not positive, but I think. So another thing, this little arm right here, that if you're like me, before adding that, a lower arm means it's less leverage, but it also means it's less throttle throw. So before my pedal movement was no pedal, all pedal. Now it's went from no pedal here to up here. So I have much more play room by adding this arm. That also adds some leverage to it, makes it easier to pull. This, by the way, is just a billet linkage. I don't remember who makes it, Scott Drake maybe, but it doesn't come bent like this. It comes straight. It's not the right alignment for a Mustang, or at least for mine. So I put a bend in it with a tubing bender. Worked like a champ. It's got this play in it, doesn't matter. It still pulls and lets go just like it should. The other thing, spring. Add springs. Do not use just the throttle blade springs. You need springs added. I'd used that method, which I just put a screw down there, just put it there. That will help bring your throttle blade shut. Some of these, some people will take this screw out down here and will put an extra wind on these springs. It's another helpful solution. Helps deal with stuff or helps add a little bit of spring tension. Uh, several people have issues, me included, with your TPS showing 1% even with the throttle let go. 1% is not an issue. 2% is. Reason being, your idle air control valve has a hold position that you set in the software. Most people, they set anywhere between like 10 and 40%. I need to set mine to about 
15 or 20 maybe, maybe less, I don't know. But that hold position opens up any time you hit 2% or above throttle. Meaning if your TPS hangs at 2%, your idle is gonna be stuck at like two grand because it's going to that hold position. Well, roughly, you know, according to whatever you have your hold position set at, it's gonna hold that and it's gonna increase the RPM accordingly. One fix they said, this is your TPS by the way, one thing they said you can do is loosen these screws and turn it a little bit and retighten them. I haven't tried that yet. Um, I'm going too soon to see if it makes a difference. It's not really a problem yet because like I said, mine's only showing 1%. 1% isn't a problem. 2% is. Mine's never stuck at 2%. I've had one time that it did stick and it stuck Every time I would hit the throttle, it would stick at whatever the max I brought it to. So first it was like 20, then I'd hit it again, tapping it, thinking my throttle linkage hung up or something. Went to like 60, then 80, then whatever, 96 or whatever a max pedal throw allows. So it was weird that it did that. It didn't, it made my car run, it made the car run like crap because it's t throwing a ton of fuel into it with the throttle blade shut and I'm not actually not on the throttle that much. But... I turned it off, let it cool, and it's never done that since, so I haven't really pursued fixing what isn't a problem anymore. But if you encounter it, that's probably something to indicate a failed ECU, or my, well not ECU, sorry, a failed TPS. Um, these things do come with map sensors. There are two bar map, I think, so they allow up to, what is two bar, like 14.7, I think, 14.9, something like that somewhere around there. So you can boost up to that level with the factory map. Past that, you'll have to add another map. I've got a map sensor I can tap into down here for my boost gauge. So I'm set on that. Um, it's got three sensor inputs on this Holly. I'm using one for that, fuel pressure. I tapped into my old pressure that's down there. And I also just installed this dome pressure sensor that's down here in my wastegate. I'm gonna grab my light. Yeah, so there's my wastegate underneath there, and there you see the sensor on the back. I'll get onto that in a little while. Actually, I'll make another video for anybody that's doing some boosties. So, back to the sniper installs and tips and whatnots. So, talked about spacer, talked about throttle linkage, talked about the sticking TPS, on to the RFI issues. Now I can't speak on this for everyone because from what I've understood is sometimes you can have everything I'm telling you perfect and you're still gonna have issues. Apparently some of these snipers come from factory with problems and Holly doesn't test them on, I guess a, a running motor setup like this. So they just boot them up and run through some tests some diagnostics and they pass them so they send them back. They don't find issues. Now, first I'll tell you what I'm running and what is working for me, just in case you want to try this to see if it fixes it. For the people that don't want to put aluminum foil, a shroud over their dizzy, or a plate block off in front bolted to your, you know, your carb studs. So, I have, obviously, 4302. I have MSD Pro Billet Distributor. I have superconductor MSD wires. All right, these are 8.5 mils. I also have these aluminum billet spark plug management bolted to my, essentially to my heads. So I don't know if this adds anything to it, but these are essentially grounding straps to these, pro, pl uh, to these plug wires. A bunch of people will say that you shouldn't join your wires like this, especially not with metal. You worry about that you risk cross spark, etc. I've had this running for I don't know how long. I've ran this thing up in the RPMs. I've I've had zero issues. I've had no RFI. I've had no issues with spark. I'm running spark control, and it's it's working flawless. So along with that, my coil is. Hyperspark. So it's a Sniper EFI Hyperspark coil. My CD box is also a Hyperspark. 
I used to run a 6AL2 programmable ignition or timing control. Since the Holly can do it, I didn't need that anymore. So I sold that and bought the coil and this box. So there's my HyperSpark. I figured why not buy the stuff that's meant to go with this sniper. So if you, as you can see, there's dash. I mounted it up underneath here. And it's bolted through to the back underneath, behind here, behind this little uh, pillar. And it's just bolted through. It's tucked away nicely inside the cab, out of the way. I can see the light if I need to, to troubleshoot it. I can access the wires and they just feed through a bulkhead on the firewall. Now, a bunch of people aren't gonna have my bulkhead set up. Most people are just gonna be feeding through with rubber grommets or whatever. I use these. These are amazing. These, in case you're wondering, are from Mavin Performance. And they are similar to what you would call mil-spec Deutsch connectors. All right. I run two of them. And these things work flawless. They are not easy to install, per se. And they're not your basic. They are a little pricey, but you get quality with price. With the kit, they sell singles. I bought a dual, well, actually I bought a single first and went back because I needed more space, so I bought a dual plate. But it comes with this mil this milled or billet plate, and then Deutsch connectors, and old boots. It comes with all the pins, instructions, etc. And so on. But that's how I feed all of my stuff through. Um, your O2 sensor. I highly recommending getting a bung welded on. Do not use that little clamp that comes with the kit unless it is temporary. So, your O2 placement needs to be, I believe it's 15 inches post uh, collector or downpipe. Downpipe in my case. Or, you know, I don't know if it's 15 inches from the collector. It might just be 12 inches from the collector. A bunch of them have an O2 sensor in the collector. I, I guess that would work. But um, you don't want to mount them straight vertical, I don't, I don't believe. And you definitely don't want them you know, straight vertical underneath because it will collect moisture. The recommended is on a, an angle like so. I have two because I have an O2 or a wideband gauge and then the Holly one. And obviously I could swap the place if that matters, but for the all that are running, you know, collector ones, several people have asked about running, you know, which side should you run it in? Or can you run two O2 sensors so it it gets readings off both sides or both banks? Sniper works off one. What I'd recommend doing is getting a bung on both sides, run it in one side for a while, data log or save the fuel map, Run on the other side for a while. This is if you're really meticulous. Most likely you can just throw it in one and go. It's, it's gonna be about the same on both. But if you're really meticulous and you wanna be you know, spot on, run in both, leave it in the bank of the side that's running more on the lean side. That way, if anything, it's not gonna starve the leaner side. It's gonna run a little bit rich on one side. So, uh, along with the sensors and whatnot, the Holly can control your fans. You have to set up relays for that. The Holly has the relay for the fuel pump. Uh, the Holly does ground outputs, ground triggers. So everything has to be to, you have to have a 12 volt supply switched or keyed or whatever to your relay and have the Holly ground trigger to send voltage out. Do not try to run any actual power through this or you will toast it or pop fuses. Um, this thing comes with, you know, several harness plugs back here. Don't let them get confusing. Most of them are kind of grouped. You have one bundle that is the power feed for the Holly. That's your power, your ground, and then your, your pink ignition trigger wire. I think your fuel pump trigger wire is on that pin out. Then you have a sensors, or mainly a sensors plug, and then you have an inputs outputs plug. A bunch of those won't get used. If you have the tools, you can take the wires out or you can just coil them up and leave them somewhere. I pulled out what I wasn't using, but now I've pretty much used almost everything. This thing can also control AC shutoff. 
So you can have an AC kick to where when you're wide open throttle or you know whatever your TPS says a certain amount, it'll cut the compressor off on the AC. So back to your RFI issues. One of the biggest things is grounding. I cannot recommend enough to go to YouTube. Obviously you're there now if you're watching this video, but search Devin Vanderhoof. I think I'm saying that name right. He has a video on proper grounding, proper wiring, and then Holly what to do's and what not to do's, etc. So you need to buy welding wire. Sell this stuff on Amazon, you can get it elsewhere, but you need to get some good quality welding wire. He'll tell you what gauge is needed, etc. If you're spending the money to go AFI, don't cheap out. I mean, this is pretty much the box of electrical stuff that I have. I mean, this is all fiberglass hose wrap. And I've got a ton of it. Braiding wrap. This is nothing but relays in that box. A uh, separate little fuse panel for use with whatever I choose to. The Deutsch removal tool. If you end up going with the bulkheads, you're gonna have to buy a, a good, well, you can do it with the little cheapy ones, but I recommend buying a good Deutsch crimp tool. I actually have the Deutsch crimp tool, HTT 4800. Those aren't that cheap. I think that was about 150 to 200 bucks. Um, yeah, so don't cheap out on wiring. Don't use those <clears throat> vampire taps, little splice clips. If you if you have to use something like this, use decent ones. These are autos only, they're not the best, but they work. Very few places on this car or on my car have these, but some places they do. So I had to use a blade connector. Um, If you plan to run sensors, buy some of these. As you see, they're color coded red and blue. It's wire sizes. I also have these blue and yellows. I believe blue is 16, yellow is 12, and red is like 18 gauge. These are. Okay, they might actually see them on them. No, well, they're butt connectors or butt splices. But yeah, there's the part number. I think these are from Dell City. Google Dell City, order you some of these. They're not that expensive. These are what you need to use for splicing wires. If you need to make any kind of wire splices, like your sensors, so to clarify, your sensors have a five volt sensor feed, a sensor ground, not to be confused with chassis ground, a sensor ground, and then your signal wire for your three pin transducer or, or your three wire transducers like this pressure sensor back here the holly has one ground one sensor ground one five volt sensor reference that feeds out you have to splice those to feed out to all your sensors all right that's how you do it you crimp those with a good pair of crimps in fact those are actually uh these right here. That's what you can crimp those with. These are just plain chain Klein crimps. Uh, all your barrel splices like these, or not these barrels? No, not barrel splices. I don't remember what these are called. Lug crimp connector kit. Okay, that's yeah, probably not. This is a cheapy Amazon kit, but they actually worked better than some of the higher dollar ones that I bought. So I kept using these. These, in case you need to order them, don't have a brand. Oh yeah, they are. These are Iwis. And there's the part number, I believe. Maybe. Anyways, you'll need that style crimp to do these, as well as the Holly connectors. If you end up making any crimps on the Holly harness, you'll need those crimps along with 
kit similar to this. They sell these on eBay and whatnot. It's just Metro Pack, Weather Pack repair kit. And then this kit that I built off of ordering, I think from Dell City. But along with your grounds, you have you know, ring terminal grounds. You have your big ground. This is the, the key set to de-pin pretty much any terminal that you have. So yeah, buy the tools you need to do the job. Don't cheap out. There's the Mavin Deutsch connector thing. And to give you an idea, let me get my key so I can show you. Tell me what that was. I'm using a Highway 22 kit. My wiring's a mess, this isn't done yet. My fuel block, this is fuel pump, uh, fuel pump one, fuel pump two. My second fan, because uh, one is on this. And this other one is a reverse lights relay because I have to use a hydraulic pressure switch. So, my power feeds. All my grounds and powers are all the same type wire, right? This right here, grounds. Now, the Holly power, along with the HyperSpark, anything electronic is highly susceptible to RFI, needs to go direct to battery. So many people on the Facebook pages, the forums, any Holly post I see of people having RFI problems, several of them are like, I'm having, you know, all this fluctuation they post a video of their handheld and their their sensors are doing this and they're you you get down you know 20 30 40 50 comments down and someone's like well did you run the connectors to the battery nah i got a i got a post on the front it, it runs the battery well what else is on that post you're you, you're getting the, the effects of anything else that's on that before it hits the battery all right, Devin stresses this in his videos like crazy. That battery is a big ass sound dampener. It is a sound eliminator. It will get rid of most of your problems by running the connections straight to that, all right? I've got these bulkheads down here. Now that ground has a ground that goes to my frame up here and then my motor block. And then on the other side, it goes from my block to the frame. I think this one, this ground here just goes to the block. So that ground goes block. Over there, I have block to frame. I have grounds between uh, pretty much everything connected to the, to the motor that need to be like alternator, ground to the block. My Hollies obviously grounded the block through those bolts. Uh, if, if you're bolting anything electronic to aprons to block whatever make sure it's not a painted surface that's making contact and you don't have to run a ground strap to it scuff away the coating a little bit like this coil it's machined it's for a reason all right so on the back side i scuffed away the paint and just dabbed it with some weld through primer because that stuff conducts and then bolted it up so my coil is grounded to the fender apron all right simple Follow the instructions. So many people don't. And then they want to wonder why they don't have problems or why they have problems. Right? So along with fuel, you know you have to have a return fuel system for this thing. So this is my feed. This is my return. I'm running intake pump. In tank pumps. There are I've got another pump output here. I've actually got dual wall bros underneath, which is why I have two powers. But they're all coming out this one. They're joined together because they're their feed out is actually like a quarter inch. So I just wide them together and feed them through this half inch line. That will feed all I need. The Holly has the ability to control a second fuel pump by boost, by RPM, by speed, whatever. And I just have them right here. With this setup, if my secondary pump fails, all I have to do is swap these plugs and I'm back running again. It's crazy, all right? Since I'm running rear battery, I'm running these 200 amp relays. Several people say that starting their car would trip these. 
I don't want to have to come pop my trunk and reset these if they happen to pop. So I put them in parallel. That means I essentially am carrying roughly 400 amps across that load. All right, this is my starter and my alternator. I'm running a high torque starter, so I don't know what it actually pulls. I've never tripped them, all right? For fuel lines, your fuel lines you had for the carburetor may do, maybe they won't. Check the star, they won't. Um, a bunch of people will use their factory fuel line as a return, and they'll run feeds. And what did I do with the light again? Oh, right here. All right. So I don't know if you'll be able to see. All right. Let's see. Probably won't be able to see this. But there's my fuel line. That's half inch stainless line. All right, back here is my filter. Now that is the, the first filter in line. Actually, no, I don't have a, before it was a pre-pump and a post-pump because I had an actual external pump. Now with intakes, that is my only filter. So that is a Holly Billet filter there. I don't remember what the micron is, 10 micron or 100 or whatever it is. Always forget if it's the higher number or the lower number that is, is the finer one. But I have both. I think I sold the other one because I did away with the external pump. But yeah, so you saw my feed that comes up here, and then my return goes to the reg and then goes out down there. And I see a bolt I need to tighten down. I'm also running remote oil filter. Do the boost. That's it down there. Uh, maybe I can see it. Yeah, that that uh plate through the gaps there. That earls. These lights suck. Well, at least mine does. All right. So I'm trying to think of what else that needs to be touched on. <laughs> no pun intended. What else I need to touch base on? So along with the uh, wiring, it's wire management. My Deutsch connector won't apply to you, but these are the sheets that come with the Deutsch connector. It shows you the number, and you have this nice chart that shows you the gauge that goes in it, cavity number, the wire color, which it's typed out because I typed most of this out and printed it and then I've made changes along the way, so I need to redo it. But along with that, this is just a quick start guide. That's all it is. Go get the full manual for this Holly and read through it, all right? Look at there, boom. Look at them stressing it again. So here are your pin outputs. Take note of this, read it carefully. Some of these can change. Like you see, I wrote launch there. It's an optional programmable ground input. The other one's an optional input as well. You don't have to use it as an AC relay. You can use it for whatever kind of input you want. Then you have these other outputs. Mine's fan one, fan two, and the AC shutdown is ran to my AC. All right, then at the bottom, there's your sensor pin connector. All right, see, reference five volt, sensor ground. Those two you have to splice. Then I have all of my inputs, outputs. My inputs, these are the sensor transducers that I want the Holly to data log. Oil pressure, dome pressure, and fuel pressure, all right? Then your outputs, fuel pump two, so I can kick that on. And then my Mac valves, which are for boost control. This won't apply to you if you're not running turbo or supercharger or something like that, but it controls boost well. I guess it wouldn't be for supercharger to be turbo. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that should cover all of that, I think. Um, I'm sure there's going to be something else I forgot that I'm, someone will mention. If you, find, if you have anything else that you're not sure of or you have questions on, ask. Uh, I don't know everything, but I do know some of the stuff because I've dealt with it already. Uh, if I forgot something, let me know. If you have input and you know it's right... 
post it. If I feel it's wrong or if I know it's wrong, I'm going to call you out on it and then post the proof of it because I see so many people post and replies on the pay Facebook page and on the forums and whatnot, just posting terrible info. I mean, the majority, the majority post is RFI issues and the majority response is get rid of the sniper. That's not a solution. That's, that's a workaround. All right. You paid money for the sniper, make the sniper work. Don't get frustrated with it and throw it in the trash or, well, I hope, I'd hope you wouldn't throw it in the trash, but sell it and go back to your carburetor or go spend twice the amount of money for a Terminator or HP or whatever for something that's overkill for your application. This is the entry level. This will do it. All right. Worst case, if you have one of the weird oddities and you are tired of dealing with Holly, doing returns and sending your stuff off and them not fixing it, etc., all you need to do is take an aluminum plate, bend it, make a little bezel out of one of these gaskets, or a template with a gasket, bend a 90 so it comes out enough to clear this, to clear the base, or the cover, and then 90 it up, and that's it, and have it cut off, you know, right here. Because all you need to do is just have something to block between the distributor and that. I don't need it. I don't really think you would need it. If you do it right, it should work. But, yeah, that should be it. And I made this video way too long. It's like damn near 40 minutes. So, if you're still watching this, this far into it, thanks for watching. And hopefully you can figure out your installation. And hopefully it all goes good for you. Get my key out of here. One, uh, one thing I can tell you is these things, some of them work out of the box. Some do. Some people can bolt them right up and they work great. Some people have to tune on them and make adjustments or use the auto learn. For me, the auto learn didn't work that great right off the bat, but because that was because I started experiencing engine troubles that were causing problems. And then I later corrected them. And so far, so good. The auto learn has been working like it's supposed to. Now the things that will throw off with auto learn, that O2 sensor. If you're having RFI issues, it's not gonna learn properly. If you have an exhaust leak, you're introducing fresh air into the exhaust and the O2 sensor, it is an O2 sensor. That is an oxygen sensor. It reads oxygen. So if you're introducing more oxygen to it, guess what? It thinks you're running lean and it's gonna start throwing fuel into it. It's gonna make your car run like shit. So make sure, like I said before, that your installation is good. Two. If you're gonna do tuning, get a laptop, download this software, and use it. Familiarize yourself with it. You can play with it without even having the sniper yet. It's free, all right? So I won't go into it a whole lot, uh, the tuning portion, but I've been playing around in this, and I'm by no means an expert, but just to give you an idea, I've already smoothed out my fuel map so much better than it was. My timing map, it doesn't start like this. It starts really just plain, like straight vertical shifts because your base wizard does idle, cruise, and wide open throttle. And I would not max those out by what you were running before. If you start doing timing control, I would go on the little bit softer retarded side and not so aggressive and then work your way up. Start smoothing it. Holly has a video that shows you how to turn that terrible 2D or 1D table, whatever, into this 2D table where you can take your mechanical distributor, your vacuum advanced distributor, and essentially overlay them and make something similar to this. All right. Along with fuel, you have a learn table. This is where you have to go to to transfer. Now, I just did a little spin earlier. And my idle still needs adjustment. I'm still running super fat at idle. So it's wanting me to reduce fuel. So I would just transfer this learning to base. Boop. It's gonna ask me if I wanna smooth it. I don't wanna smooth it. So no. Now we go back to base fuel. And boom, all these little dots 
That's what changed. I'll save that. Now when I go to boot it back up, I'll have to go to this right here, sync with ECU, and I'll have to send it to the ECU. So to show you that real quick, here's my fuel pump. I think I need a new fuel pressure regulator. I don't know why mine squeals like that. So I will go and click sync with ECU. It's telling me fuel failed and boost failed because I made changes to both. So send to ECU. Boom, done. So go check my boost setup. That's what I changed. I need to change it back. In case you're curious, fill row values just does the math for you to do a smooth transition between what's selected. You can also do fill column values where it applies. All right. Send the ECU once more. Done. So there we go. So yeah, this software is not complicated. It's quite simple to use. All right. Then you can also do a USB link here at the top. That links you up with the ECU to make changes on the fly. So you can tune fuel and spark while it's running. Then you have this toggle strip chart. This is essentially a live data log. You can also data log. And that's what you would use to send your logs to a tuner if you choose to have someone else review it or to tune it for you. They just email you. You email the file, they'll edit the config. You'll email your config and a data log. They'll compare it, make changes to your config, send it back. And you'll do just like I just did. You'll open a config file and you'll go to this compare or this uh, sync and you'll sync it with your ECU. That simple. So, like I said, it's not hard. You just gotta take your time. Read. I know a bunch of people that are in the car just like me don't like to read, but uh, yeah, it helps. It's crazy. But, um, yeah, if you don't want to read, do like I do. Watch videos. Holly has a ton of videos. Go to YouTube, check out their videos. Check out Devin Vanderhoof's videos. There's a bunch of other people that are running these Hollies that have input and info. I can't think of them right now, but there's several people I've been watching that have all the info you need to pick up on this and to just start rolling with it. I mean, don't be afraid. Just don't make any drastic changes. And these video, a bunch of these videos will tell you the do's and don'ts. Like there's some things you don't want to use in the software because it will jack your tune up and you could erase pretty much everything you've already learned or all the changes you've already custom made. Like the smooth effect. Be careful using that. You'll wipe out a whole bunch of stuff on accident with one click. It does have an undo. It does not undo smooth because that's not a change that you made. Undo, undo something that you did. Clicking that smooth button doesn't count. Anyways, I'll wrap this up. Um, yeah, so uh, if you like what you saw, if I didn't bore you to death, if you're still watching this, sub and uh, stick around. Maybe I'll put out some more info that can help you along the way. All right, guys. Adios.